anniversary of uh, the eviction commemoration. It's always been a special time for us to engage, welcome, and acknowledge all the hard work and beautiful young routes coming up. We appreciate you guys all taking the time to make an effort. It's not easy for some of us to uh, get out of the house today. So we appreciate you all uh, caring so much to come and celebrate, acknowledge, and uh, reason with us why we're here today to commemorate the 36th I Hotel anniversary celebration. Okay, so once again, uh, my name for the record is uh, Roy Arecio. I'm a Manila Town Board President. I have been for the last few years. Thank you, thank you very much. And, um, it's always been my pleasure to uh, be a part of Manila Town. I've always taken great pride, mainly because I also have roots, just like all of you do, whether you know it or not. Whether you're Carmen Choi, Emil Guzman, Belvin, Louis, Michael Oda, we all have roots here. And uh, young folks from Cal, from San Francisco State, from City College, uh, we do too. We do too. Because we're all in a struggle for equal rights, social justice, and housing. Housing, and includes fair housing for not just certain people, but for everybody. And that's what the iHotel is all about. Maintaining the semblance of dignity for those folks who struggle to have housing as a human right so they can live their life fairly, justly, and equally, just like everybody else. And that was part of the film's history to actually notate and document our experiences as Asians coming to this country. So in the you know, fabric of American society, we always hear about, you know, someone else did this, those folks over there did that. But we Filipinos and each Asian Americans have also done this right here. We've done this right here. Okay? For years and years and decades and generations, we've contributed to the fabric of America. It's not very necessarily written as Don Obama knows in all the history books, but it's going to be our responsibility to tell our stories. And this is where you can come and tell your story, be heard, be respected, and also flourish to achieve the goals that you set forth for your life. Okay? So please, uh, once again, on behalf of Manila Town's Board of Directors, we appreciate once again you taking the time to come out and celebrate this day, this great day with us today. Thank you. Remarks actually, that's what makes me remarks, and hope they did okay. <laughs> but once again, my father, I'm here as president, my father walked up and down Kearney Street, and as Albert Wilson always tells us, 10 blocks, 10 block stretch of Kearney from Columbus to Market Street with a Filipino enclave, adorned with hotels, restaurants, barber shops, pool halls, and places of uh, you know, places where people can convene because just like the Japantown the street and Chinatown next door, they had enclaves at the time. Enclaves where little brown brothers weren't necessarily wanted in the outskirts of those areas. That's why they formed these enclaves so they can live, breathe, and speak their language and also share information and live their lives without having to go and deal with fear across town, whether it were wild riots or you know accusations or discrimination in other parts of town. People can come to Green Street. Chinatown, Manila Town, Japan Town, and feel comfortable. Now we live in a different society now because of those sacrifices that were made from the previous Manangs and Manangs from back in the previous generations as we know. And we're here standing on their shoulders because of all their great struggles, sacrifices, and their sincere conviction to make sure that our generation prospers and achieves our goals. So when you are here today, I want you to take a minute or two right now to meet someone who you haven't met before, and also we'll write this 36th anniversary by mentioning to them why you're here. So from the East Bay, yeah. from the South Bay, to the North Bay, from the gay community, to the Latino community, from the American community, to the you know, clergy, to every labor union was here that night on August 4th. They didn't necessarily talk, but they linked arms in solidarity. And we, we will, you know, Acknowledge the commemoration and Pamela Vigil later on, but I just want to give you a semblance of what it was like to come together, come together, just like I did 36 years ago. Okay, so just to think about uh, you know why we're here today to meet people and share this great time, or share this great space. Okay, so once again, thanks for doing that. I did that in college one time. Thanks for hanging in there with me. So very important. I was reminded that the I have to tell a story is also a story of protest and resistance of our community. And that we all know how to fight pretty well. After college, I left the state, and unfortunately this block was still an empty vessel. When I returned to California in 2004, I was so glad to hear that the dream of building a new international hotel was well on its way. 
I was reminded then that not only are we a community that knows how to fight the good fight, but we are also resilient and that we can persevere. While it's unfortunate that far too many of the residents that were evicted were able to return home to their idle cell, we honor them by reminding each other of the fight and by passing along the story of resilience and perseverance with all. I'm blessed to have two daughters and my loving wife, Ms. Alan Sahan over there. It's my hope that when I tell them the story of the Island it's a source of pride. And I hope that it's staying for all of you. Just this afternoon, driving from Sacramento, uh, we were able to read Anthony Bobas' version, La Casa de Makibaka Hotel. And I think they enjoyed their reading that. And I think they were enjoying reading it time to time. One of the great things of electing the first Filipino American legislators were able to introduce legislation specific to the Filipino American community. Hope many of you have already heard about Assembly Bill 123. It's well on its way to the government. This bill requires that the contributions of Filipino Americans in the far labor movement is included in our curriculum. It's in the Senate Appropriations Committee. We're anticipating that it gets off, uh, off that committee onto the Senate floor has yet to receive one no vote. And knock on wood, there'll be a good, the governor will sign that bill into law soon enough. Let me close by saying praise to the Manila, Manila, Heritage, Manila Town Heritage Foundation, all the leaders that, again, work very, very hard to ensure that the legacy of our moms and moms here in Manila Town live far beyond 36 years, and we're going to continue to be here to remember and honor that. Thank you very, very much. Chronology of events that happened on August 3rd, 1977. Um, 3 p.m. August 3rd. The news media receives a printed form from the police department. Guidelines for the press corps for the eviction of the tenants from the International Hotel. 11:30 p.m. Over a thousand supporters are marching around the hotel, surround the site, chanting slogans and singing, "We shall not be moved." Groups of undercover police officers are already patrolling the Manila town area. Midnight, August 4th. The leaders of the support groups announced on the loudspeaker, announced an estimated 250 police, 50 sheriff deputies, and about 15 mounted police are assembling at City Hall and on Market Street. 12.30 a.m. Support leaders speculate that police and deputies will arrive within an hour. The crowd on Carrying Street continues to grow. Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> you know, meanwhile, we really had no idea. It took eight years of a lot of uh, difficult work, sacrifices, and learning lessons by making almost every mistake you could possibly make. Um, and that's what led up to that very dramatic conviction. So where does uh, Joe Jonas come in? I think I was given the hardest question to talk about. <laughs> I'll have to talk to Amy about that. Um, Joe was our first manager, and uh, unlike the other folks that we'll be talking about, oh. Yeah, he's here. Here. This is his chair. <laughs> anyway, um, I thought it would be a bigger picture of Joe, so you can see uh, he was a rough customer. Uh, he had uh, been on the street uh, for decades, in and out of almost every hotel, and he knew what this was going on there. Um, and that is his <laughs> wow. Does anyone have his baseball bat? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think because Joe was he was a, he was about this high. Um, even by Filipino standards, he was not considered tall. Um, and he, um, but he was a scrapper. I don't know how else to describe him. He was a scrapper, and he he never backed down from the fight. And he had all the scars and all the punched-in bones on his face and on his body to prove that he never backed down from the fight. Um, and we needed someone like Joe, because literally, we're. What, 19 years old, but the reader. So we absolutely needed someone like Joe Williams um, and some of the other people we've talked about tonight. But because he was so cantankerous, um, the other folks are, are kind of saintly, and we remember them because they were so saintly. Uh, Joe is a more uh, checkered memory. So that's why I did a hard job to say why we love Joe Jonas and why Joe Jonas was so important to this struggle. So um, what does it mean to be the first manager of the International Hotel? You have to remember that um, we, the tenants, had an eviction notice saying you have 30 days to get out. Okay? And we went in and basically said, um, no, actually, we're not moving. And in fact, um, here's the new manager. Okay, So um, I hope that captures some of the feistiness Joe had to say, OK, we're not moving, and I'll be the new manager. Okay. Um, the other thing is Joe uh, was a really good organizer. He, his family. Uh, comes from uh, the plantations of Hawaii. He was an organizer as a young man, and he was a good organizer. Uh, he was a natural organizer. And uh, I thought of one thing that would capture this. Joe could have long discussions with the Chinese tenants upstairs, and they would talk to the Chinese, and he knew five words of Chinese. <laughs> okay. But people felt like they could talk to him. And he would talk to them, and let them talk to him, and he no no Chinese. Okay. Uh, he would say occasionally, hello, hello, uh, just to punctuate, shake his head yes. Um, but the key thing is people trusted Joe, and they would bring his, the problems to Joe. So he was a really good organizer. Um, what he told us a lot was, um, as a young man, he was organizing in Hawaii, and there was a very important strike, uh, Filipino uh, uh, plantation worker strike. And um, they had sent to the Philippines to uh, recruit uh, scabs to come and break that strike. And so they sent Joe to Manila to start to organize the scabs that they were recruiting in Manila. And then he got on the boat as though he were um, just another laborer, and he organized on that boat. When that boat landed in Honolulu, the Filipinos got off, and they signed up with the union. And they weren't able to break that strike. 
So Joe Joe has had really good days. He really had some really good days. Now when we met him, he was much older and he had been through a lot of stuff. And some of it we didn't want to know. But um, here's what I think um, is important about Joe. When he was the manager, uh, the, the owner of the building, who by the way was the head of the Democratic uh, Party machine in San Francisco, considered a liberal, okay, um, were basically saying, you're all going to get out of this building. And Joe, when he came in as manager, let all of the uh, left and progressive groups come into this building as tenants on the first floor and in the basement. Uh, that was a masterful move. He basically uh, pulled in a lot of community support and literally said, come and open your offices here. So we owe that to Joe. Uh, he was the manager. He could have said no. Um, he could have said, what are you letting all those leftists and communists into the building for? But uh, he was an experienced enough organizer to know, we will not win this if we don't figure out how to give a home to the progressives in Chinatown, and we did that. Okay. Which didn't mean we all got along together. <laughs> but the point is, uh, we were all living together, literally, in this building. Um, those of us that are up here tonight, um, we had a division of labor, and ours was to basically work with the tenants upstairs. And why that's important is because no matter how many progressive groups you had in the storefronts, None of it was going to work if the tenants were not organized. And that's what fell on, on us, although we didn't know what we were doing. We had to figure out how do you organize uh, tenants who uh, fe really feel that they have no power and actually do not have much power. They don't know important people. They don't have any money. Okay, So uh, it's not just that they were, um, had low self-esteem. They actually didn't have much power. Um, and so it's in that context that a scrappy guy like Joe Dionis uh, steps in and says, okay, I'll run this place. So I'm stressing all the good things about Joe. Um, <laughs> the other thing um, I remember about Joe, which um, I was his little banker, right? And so um, he was really good at managing stuff. So whenever there was a, um, anything to be organized with the tenants, uh, Joe would go in and he would give people assignments and say, you, hey, you cook, you cook things here. Okay, you, you're going to come here, we're going to set this table. You just set up the tables like that. So he was very important in the early years in getting those kinds of events organized. But here's the key thing I want you to remember, Joe. This hotel, um, the way we talk about it, the way you'll see, about, see it in the movie tonight, was not what this hotel was when Joe became manager. This hotel was wide open for every drug dealer in North Beach, Chinatown. They had free reign into this building. Okay? They could walk in, they could recruit, they could sell their wares, and they could walk up and down those stairs to buy them. And then we had um, prostitutes. Um, and this is really nothing against prostitutes. They do a very important business in this part of town all over the world. Uh, but the, the problem with the prostitutes wasn't that they were engaged in the oldest profession known to mankind, but that they would come and walk the halls and knock on doors. Okay. And uh, what Joe Jonas did is uh, he sat in that chair and he would sit. He was like a mean pole boy. He sits like this. And as soon as someone walked up those stairs, he'd jump up and grab his back. Okay? And that's what I remember about Joe. That was very important because the work that we did in organizing could only be done in safety. I'll say it again. We could not have organized this hotel and this struggle if we didn't have safety. 
and believing that this hotel was a front street for every uh, criminal element in this area. Okay? And it took Joe maybe a year. And I would say only Joe Dionis could have pulled that off. Uh, he was just that tough and just that cantankerous. Okay, so he would go toe to toe with the drug dealers. And so he made it clear, you do your business outside. If someone wants to bring in drugs, they bring it in, but you do not come in here and conduct your business in these hallways. And to the, to the, uh, the prostitutes, he said, to everyone who needed prostitutes, these were a lot of single men, uh, no families. He was very explicit. He said, you go outside and you make your date, and then you bring your date in with you. And he said to the girls, you cannot come in here and not go to girls. That is very important. I hope people appreciate that. Okay. Uh, so I'm not trying to say, oh, the International Hotel became heaven, there were no drugs, there were no prostitution, no. That was never the case. But we had safety, and we could start a organization. And if we don't say anything else, uh, thank God for your feelings. You know, I think I remember Joe Neal, he always reminded me of uh, Edward G. Robbins. <laughs> That's what he reminded me of. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, the gift of extemporaneous speaking, like Bruce. So I'm going to read from something that I wrote about Lahat and hope that in this you get a sense of who this man was. Because he was definitely, toward the end of the struggle of the International Hotel, an incredible leader. A fine mist covered the sidewalk and the windows of cars, businesses, and even my eyeglasses, as Wahak Tom Powell, treasurer of the International Hotel Tennis Association, and I emerged from the hotel that morning, August 4th, the morning of the eviction. No sooner did we plant our feet on the sidewalk did I hear a mournful wailing sound coming from Wahai. While his arms were still draped around my shoulder, he fell to his knees and he looked up toward the sky and said, I failed. I failed. I failed to stop the image. Where will we go from here? Oh my God, what will happen to us? There on the sidewalk, Wahat fell to his knees. Tears were streaming down his face. This once proud Benguet warrior from the Cordilleras of Northern Luzon threw his shield and bolo down in defeat. I lifted him up and said to him, Wahai, it's going to be all right. Believe me, it's going to be all right. I never believed our situation would be all right. And for the first time in a very, very long time, I was lost for words. And there we were hobbling down Kearney Street toward Portland Square, where the rest of the tenants had gathered that cold, misty, and dreary August morning. So who was Wahat Kampau? Wahat came to the United States in 1929, two years before my own father. He left the Philippines to come to America with the idea of working and sending money home to his wife and his children and hoped that one day soon he would return to his own Rocky Mountain time, to be reunited with his family and friends. He said he was Benga from the mountain provinces of the Cordilleras. This mountain area was home to several native tribes, which were collectively known as Igor, which is not 
a term that is now being used. Living amidst the rice terraces and that towered over northern Luzon are a people whose ways of life existed long before any Spaniard or other foreigners stepped on Philippine soil. The Bontoc, Ipugao, Benguet, Apayo, Kalinga tribes reigned over the zones of mountain area. And this was the stock, this was the blood that men like Wahat came from. Fearless, compassionate, level, loving, and proud. When Wahat arrived on the shores of the United States, he made his way down to the middle town, where the International Hotel was, and made his home there in 1945. He would live at the hotel off and on, mainly due to his stint in the Navy and after as a merchant marine. But each time he came back, he'd find his way back to the hotel the closest thing to being back home in the Philippines. The smells and sounds of Manila Town and Chinatown comforted Wahad. He had friends who also lived at the hotel. The food was like music to his mouth. And the fishing was good all year round. Wahat was one crazy guy when it came to fishing. He'd get up before the first produce trucks arrived to unload the produce in Chinatown, make his way down to SF Pier, decked out in his plastic pail, rod and wheel, rubber boots, and his thermos of coffee, and return home just as we were leaving to go to work. Well, Hunt didn't say much, but when he did, people listened. At the I Hotel Tenants Association meetings, he'd sit in the back smoking on his back. And if you looked at his face, you could tell he was taking in every word, every emotion, every movement of anyone in that room. He wasn't a tall man, maybe 5'4". His face was smooth, his cheekbones high and his hair was a mass of thick silver gray. He loved to dance, loved to share stories, and he loved children. Many of the tenants looked up to Wahad. Many sought out his opinion on a variety of issues facing the hotel. And if he didn't have an answer or an opinion, he'd say, let me think about it. For what? For a while. I believe Wahat was one of the very few tenants that came up through the rungs who eventually challenged the old guard of the IHTA, which was Joe. And together with Emilio Guzman, president of the IHTA, they deposed the leadership, implemented democratic reforms for the tenants' meetings and led the IHTA through the twists and turns of the anti-eviction process. Well, Hutt was not a born leader. He wasn't even articulate. He had a very thick accent and had very different cultural practices than most of the other tenants, mainly because he was from the upland. But what, whatever Wahat learned, about being a leader. He learned in the truest sense of the phrase, student, teacher, student, teacher. There was nothing magical or mystical about Wahat. He was a simple man that wanted the simple things in life. Food, clothing, housing, medical insurance, and a community he called home. And for Wahat, the International Hotel in Manila Town was his home and community. The night of the eviction. Wahat and I were in a large room on the second floor 
There were about 15 people all squeezed into that room, listening to the screams by supporters outside. Supporters who surrounded the building in order to block the eviction. Then we heard loud, smashing sounds. We huddled together like frightened animals, only our scar. Our room became deadly silent as the smashing neared our room. In the hallway, Sheriff Hamdisto and his deputy Sledge hammered all the toilets and sinks so no one could use them again. Wahat grabbed my hand and we looked at one another, knowing all too well it was our turn to leave the building. That any minute now, the deputies would come through that door and forcibly evict us from the only home we knew, the International Hotel. In all this madness, Wahat leaned toward the window after hearing hundreds of supporters screaming as the mounted police people stopped down on them, swinging their batons. The screams outside were too much for Wahat to bear. He lunged toward the window, which was already nailed shut, and started to pry it open. I asked him, Wahat, what are you doing? He said, I can't stand it anymore. So many people getting hurt. We have to stop this. Tell the police to stop. Stop hurting the supporters. I looked at him and I said, what? It's too late to stop the eviction. It's too late for anything to stop. We held one another. We held tight as the sheriff's, sheriff's deputies yelled on the other side of our door, stand back. Stand back from the door. We're going to smash it in. Stand back. As we stepped back from the door, the sledgehammer pounded away at the thick wooden frame. As we yelled, not to smash the door, please don't, the sledgehammer hit the door dead center. It flew off the hinges and splintered into a thousand pieces. A fine mist covered the sidewalk of the windows and the cars and businesses and even my eyeglasses as Wahat Tamhao, treasurer of the International Hotel Tennis Association, and I emerged from the hotel that morning, August 4th the morning of the eviction. Wahat lived for another several years, and I believe also uh, moved with the rest of the tenants. And then he took, moved to Seattle, where his relatives were. Wahat has since died. But I will tell you, that was one brother that had swag. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Uh, it's just amazing to see the diversity of faces who are part of the movement, the struggles of our community. Um, I'm going to tell you something that is common among many of our Asian American elected officials that we often don't talk a lot about, and that is many of your local elected officials did not grow up here in San Francisco. Ed Lee grew up in Seattle. My colleague who represents South Market, Jane Kim, grew up in New York City. Eric Marr, who has been an amazing progressive activist within the Asian American community, grew up in Sacramento. And I grew up in Boston. And what brought all of us to San Francisco was not just the fact that we have the oldest Asian American community in the country, where we're at right now here in Chinatown. But as we all know, August 4th, 1977, the birth of the Asian American movement really started. And those of you who are part of it, you are our heroes, you are our heroines, you inspire all of us to fight for immigrants, to fight for labor, to fight for working folks, to fight for affordable housing, all the things that the I Hotel has come decades later to, to symbolize. So I really just wanted to come and
pay my respects to the Manongs who are here. Pay my respects to those heroines who stood up at a time when I don't think any of us could imagine how difficult it would have been to stand up. And I just want to thank you for that on behalf of the city and county of San Francisco. And also to say, it has been an amazing honor for me to not only represent District 3, not only represent Chinatown, but represent the International Hotel. And to the young folks who are here, I'm going to tell you, I am in my second and last term. I'm about to be turned out in a few years. And we need to make sure that the next generation of Asian American leadership here in this city has an emotional, a spiritual connection to what this is about, why we're here tonight. So it's so important for those of you who are going to be our next generation of leaders to, to, to take this in, to be a part of what this is about, uh, and to never forget the International Hotel. So with that, I'd like to uh, bring up, actually sitting right next to me, is a man who I've known for years, Emil, um, I know you not only embody the spirit of this building, and we know that here the souls of the fight rest on, but you are an embodiment of what this is about, and I know you are uh, just a brother among many brothers and sisters in the struggle, but on behalf of the Board of Supervisors, I want to acknowledge the 36th I Hotel eviction, uh, and just say, as we continue, Mabuhai, thank you very much.
were either the prostitutes, maybe the girlfriends who were organizers, and maybe even the girls who uh, were attempting to break the strike. These are the women that um, Bolasans in Bill Asan's book talked about. But in actuality, there were actually women who were activists also in the struggle. And um, there was also some very strong gender dynamics that was going on there. And it had to do with the fact that this was a primarily a male um, uh, immigration wave of laborers. And, um, but the women who became activists, um, many of them were also working class. But because of the time and the way uh, the movement was generated at that time, um, it's very uh, male-centered without kind of giving some credence or some um, validity to the female experience. So um, with that in mind, I wanted to uh, talk about this is Della Cruz. She was one of the people who was evicted, but more importantly, she was one of the people who organized uh, people in the IHTA, uh, the International Child Tenants Association. And she was really kind of like an aunt uh, uh, to me and an aunt to, uh, to Emil and the rest of us. Uh, and Jeanette, and so, you know, we would go there every day. And she was the one that I related to the most. Um, so gender dynamics erupted in many parts of the movement at the time. And women leading, ability to lead or take power, um, did not come up in the context of I hotel struggle. Uh, however, they were there. We never really talked about it. There was one instance, though, where um, Bruce mentioned about how uh, Joe Dionis got rid of the prostitutes and the drug dealers. Well, it turns out that the women who were the activists in the hotel were getting hit upon um, amorously uh, by some of the guys, okay? And so, well, of course, you know, these are, some of them are single guys, and the women had a caucus, okay? And so they brought it up to um, uh, Joe Dionis, who then set down the law and said, you know, these relations that happen between men and women have to be you know, a, a legitimate kind of relationship that's not based on um, exploitation. <laughs> and um, so he set down the law, okay, and um, many of those men started respecting the women a little bit more because the women that they were used to talking to were those prostitutes. And so you find a whole generation of Filipina activists inside the hotel, and they didn't know how to relate to them. Okay, but we were so young ourselves. I was only 22. Uh, I was one of the older ones. <laughs> and um, you know, uh, we didn't know about how to struggle about this. Okay, so so Mrs. D. Many people would not consider her a leader, but yet we are promoting her as a leader today. You know, we, we feel that she is. Um, and um, why? Well, um, at one point she did do a speech. And she had asked Emil to, to write it for her. And he did. And she spoke on International Women's Day. And she said to him, Emil, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> Please do not ask me to do that again. So I was kind of laughing in the back, but 
we knew that sometimes people have to step up, but she didn't want to do that anymore. So what she did was she coordinated brunches that included the music and dancing, you know, just like the way you might today, as a young activist, um, say woman, in your group, organize something for your group. And you don't get credit for it because the guys who are leading it are usually the male in front of everybody, in front, right? And so the women never get uh, recognized. What did she also, she made it a home-like atmosphere. So after Joe Dionis got rid of all those so-called riffraff, <laughs> you know, she put curtains on the wall, uh, she made, uh, she, that, that picture up there, uh, on the far left, uh, she brought plants, you know, she cooked food for us, um, and she played a very important role of translating um, to, uh, to the tenants um, all the different twists and turns of the legal battles in the Filipino dialect, Tagalog, etc. And both Emil and I didn't know how to speak that lot the language. And that's another story why we don't. But um, we needed someone like her to do that. Without someone like her, I don't think the struggle would have proceeded in the way it could because communication is very important. So, um, how did she get this way? You know, well, she was born in 1925. She worked all her life. Uh, she worked in very uh, diff in different jobs in Manila. And during the Japanese occupation of World War II, um, she, her father disguised her as a boy so that the Japanese soldiers would not sexually abuse her. As a young woman, she became tough and independent, and as she arrived in the U.S. in the 1969, she found a job in the garment industry. During her eight-year stay at I Hotel, she worked in a factory, came home from the factory after working in a sweatshop-type job, cooked food for us, explained these twists and turns in these evening meetings, and in the weekends, worked at the I Hotel preparing Filipino food for various college outings and celebrations. Okay, so she was an activist already early in her life. She participated in union organizing in the Philippines. And because, as she explained, the factory owner was a New York Jew, quote, a liberal who allowed union organizing to take place at her factory. She always seemed to know what she wanted and was very blunt about it. She was not brash, however. In fact, she was quite sweet and charming. But when her leadership was called upon, she usually responded affirmatively and forthrightly, especially if she knew what was required. Mrs. D's commitment to the struggle came out of her sense of duty and responsibility to take care of family members. She had what we call the Bionian spirit, that of helping young people and her countrymen, and a sense of caring for the elderly. Both traits are valued in the Filipino culture and were important in the Ayantel struggle. And her example had a great influence on the young Filipinos. <laughs> All right. I'm supposed to do the other woman, too. I don't know if I got pigeonholed on that shirt. <laughs> oh, OK. 4 o'clock AM. The smell of horse manure fills the cold night air. As the police joke and laugh about their direct hits, there is an unreal silence and calmness as the demonstrators regroup and pull themselves tighter together in front of the hotel door. There is the sound of shattering glass as other
other police and sheriff deputies smash their way into the storefronts on the sides of the hotel. 4 10 a.m. As the human barricade moves toward Jackson Street, supporters on the other side of the police on Jackson link arms to form another human chain facing the police. Presenting this defensive line, the members of the human barricade are able to safely reach the other side of Jackson Street. 4 11 a.m. The hotel's main entrance is unguarded. 4 14 a.m. Sheriff Richard Hongisto in turtleneck sweater and sport coat Incongruous with all other uniformed police and deputies, strides up to the doorway and peeks in between the cracks of the double door of the hotel. Apparently, the doors are barricaded from the inside, so he enters the hotel through the side entrance of the IHTA storefront. Within minutes, the first of the supporters inside the hotel are carried out. The first four supporters removed and begin to reform the line and chant, No evictions, we won't move. Under Sheriff Jim Devin, who seems to be giving all the orders for the entire operation, asks police to move the chanters to Clay Street, where police have another barricade. The officers literally pounce on the chanting supporters and pin their arms behind their backs and jerk them away. Devin screams, easy, easy, to control the overzealous police. To know that during the eviction night, uh, we shall not be moved was sad, and so we changed uh, we changed the uh, lyrics a little bit. There's the microphone. We would like to add Jody on this. Instead of they are with us, we shall not be moved. After Felix Eisen, we would like to add Jody on this his name. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, Kawaiian is on guitar, Saramaya is on the violin, and it really pays um, spending money on these kids growing up so they can accompany us for the money at a time as well. So, um, what is this? Entertainment? Except that Kawaiian's a little cheaper because you learned how to play guitar through YouTube. <laughs> yeah! We the move! I also would like to acknowledge my brother, Jose Aguari, who actually built the uh, trellis. And you can see that the names are, of all the tenants are on the trellis right there. And we, later on, we'll, uh, Roy will ex actually explain what to do with them.
wanted to say hello to the Manongs and the Manongs. Uh, they're sitting over there. We have, we have uh, Ron, Connie, Constance. We have um, Juliana. <laughs> and Jose, who was a good friend of my Uncle Al. And there was another mono in the back. I think it was Rudy who was singing, he sang all those songs by the platters, and I hope that he did not leave, because he has a voice that can shatter glass, and I mean that in a good way. He did leave. Oh, man, we're going to have to go back up to the roof. Get him back down, sing that song. Um, as, um, as Roy mentioned, uh, Jeff Tagami uh, was a uh, very close uh, friend of Manila Town, uh, Jeff Tagami, uh, you could say uh, his heart was uh, the heart of Manila Town, the heart of Watsonville, uh, and the heart of Lombi, Mendelet, and the heart of Asparagus, the heart of uh, Cauliflower. Uh, he wrote a book called the October Light, uh, which uh, is just a, uh, just a very uh, a brilliant, uh, very uh, heart warming and heart-touching uh, collection of poems. And a lot of the poets that came through Manila Town, um, I may have been 12 years old, 13 years old, uh, seeing some of the poets that came through who were the storytellers, who uh, knew the old-timers that lived in the I Hotel, uh, poets like uh, Lou and uh, Seraphim Sakia, uh, Oscar Penderada, um, poets like uh, Shirley Anchetta, uh, Virginia Sereno, um, and uh, what they uh, did basically was uh, being in the I Hotel and getting to know the Manos and learning their stories and having a relationship with the Manos, which it was like having extended uncles and aunties, right? Um, through that, uh, through their poetry, they were able to give a gift back to that Mano generation. Their poetry is the gift back uh, to the Manos who had given their gift of uh, mentorship and, and friendship. Uh, so that being said, I want to just read uh, two poems. One poem by uh, Jeff Tagami, and the uh, next one will be by Al Robles. Uh, the first poem is called Labor of Love by Jeff Tagami. When my mother and I entered the orchard with our ladders. The morning moisture wet everything. The leaves, the apples, the dust that fell on them all night. And then that dust became mud, which stuck to our hands and dried when the sun came out. The boss, who stopped by earlier in his Jeep, reminded us to take our time so as to not to bruise the apples they call golden delicious. How you must, with great care, gently rock them into the bin as if putting a sleeping child to bed. It's like a labor of love, he said. Because the apples were the same color as the leaves, a light green, Picking was slow, having to reach into a clump of leaves blindly until we felt the smooth glow. Come on out, little darlings, my mother called to them as though they were hiding. I suggested she stick with the short ladder to pick only the ones hanging low. From above, I could keep an eye on her, making sure she planted making sure she planted her ladder firmly in the soft earth, asking her politely to empty her bag before it got too full. It was when I ran out of ladder and had to climb into the tree that I began singing, hoping this would ease, hoping this would ease my fear and my mother's fear for me. Careful, she said, careful. And I began singing her favorite song. 
I'm in the mood for love. Until I had to stop and ask her for the right words, coaxing her finally to sing along, her sweet voice lifting above the scant chattering of birds in the canyon. Over the canyon, a jetliner lazily headed west, nothing between it and me but blue sky and my black hand poking from the tops of trees and waving, there being so much love in my heart and heaven in my eyes. The, uh, heart of, uh, the heart of Jeff Tsugami is the heart of the uh, I Hotel, and the heart of the I Hotel is in the heart of Tagami, and I can understand by uh, uh, through reading Jeff Tagami's work why my uh, why my uncle loved him so much, why the Militant loved him so much. And uh, this next poem is about a, a tenant leader, uh, Felix Ison, who I'm assuming uh, will be spoken about shortly. Um, I was at the uh, Civic Center Residence Hotel over on uh, Turk. I think it is, or, or any. Uh, but anyway, I saw uh, there was a, a false fire alarm, and there was a mono who came out and looked just like Felix Eisenhorn. And I said, You look just like Felix Eisenhorn. He said, Oh! I said, We gotta come to the Eye Hotel to find out. But anyway, uh, this, is a, this is called, uh, and this is from uh, uh, Uncle Al's book of uh, poetry, uh, which owes everything to the the people that lived here in the island. And it's called Manum Felix. Dear Manum Felix, when I see your brown face, I see the rainforest of my people. Before white man's history, the Luzon mountain landscape clears my mind in the deep crevices of your ancient face. The Pasig River flows in Atbayan village your family was celebrating your life, Mom Felix. I see my tatai, my nanai, my ninong, my ninang, and anak, and kapatid, and lolo, and lola, in you. The chicken adobo smells good. I can taste the thick adobo tails of your life inside your small room. The rice is cooked, your mata catches mine like a fishnet. My coconut body sways toward you. Watch the sun burst forth. And one, one last thing I want to say. I want to um, uh, remember uh, two activists that recently passed. Uh, Jazzy Collins, who uh, passed away. We just had a, uh, for Jazzy, so rest in peace and rest in power, Sister Jazzy. And there was another activist that uh, died in May, and I didn't even, even know about his name. But I don't know if you know, uh, his name was Shorty Lagasca, Samuel Shorty Lagasca. He was a Vietnam vet, he was a, uh, he was a tenant activist and tenant organizer. And he said that, uh, he said that any part of, because I told him, I said, I'm part of black and Filipino. He says, well, hey, any part of Filipino you got in you is a part worth fighting for. And he made the best, he said he made the best adobo in town. Um, hang in there. Uh, we're going to have this march a little while. It's getting dark, much more dark. And so uh, it'll be myself and the monster. And I guess Peter. We have Peter. Yeah. Um, I was going to also try to read a little bit about Felix. Uh, I knew Felix as a, uh, a volunteer working in the International Hotel. He was one of those extraordinary leaders, like a rock star. He had a big following here in the International Hotel because uh, he was just a very eloquent speaker. And when you see the film on the International Hotel, his, the words that he utters is, um, 
the buyback plan is an eviction plan. And a lot of people, years have gone by since that film has been out, and a lot of people don't really understand. What does that mean? So I'm going to try to talk about it, but I don't want to talk about it at this moment. But I did want to say uh, something about how Ronald Felix um, had a great smile. He was a wonderful, gentle um, man who really uh, made you feel very special when you were with him. Uh, he would like to try to find out about you. And one of the most extraordinary things that you would never know about Felix is that um, he was completely deaf. He couldn't hear. The only way you could communicate with Felix was by writing. And that was the only way he could communicate with you. But he couldn't hear. And yet this man was so extraordinary that he, he was so intelligent, he could take some of the most complicated and, uh, issues and he could be able to speak to big crowds. And he could explain things very clearly. And um, I remember um, in the film you saw his black cat. That was his companion who was in room 201, which is in the corner here in, in the hotel. And I used to go visit him. Um, he, you know, he and I had a very cordial relationship. It was not always cordial. Sometimes we always had arguments. I'd have to always really write fast. But, you know, then he, because he'd scream at me, and I'd have to give him back my argument. But I could only, I could only just write. I couldn't scream back because he couldn't hear. But, but it was the way. But it was. He had a very uncanny way still of uh, always, uh, you know, making you feel. He never put you down. He always, always had this way of, of, um, of expressing his. You know, very gentle, very honest uh, way with you. And I remember a picture of him in this ballroom with hundreds of other Filipinos, and there were many white women in there. And as you know, the uh, many Filipino elderly who came in the 20s, uh, they, were, they, were, they were mostly bachelors. The ratio was 14 to 1. And, uh, and I believe the, the woman that he was staying with was his wife, and she, I believe she was Japanese American. Uh, but he was in a very beautiful, he was in a very nice suit, very handsome man, you know, at the time. I don't know what happened, uh, you know, to him, that marriage, maybe someone else knew, maybe Michael might be able to shed some light. Um, one of the things that I, I want to also add um, is that many of these monos and many of these folks did not you know, when I got to know them, they were really wonderful, simple folks. You know, just folks who, who you could just really have a nice conversation with. But because of the pressure that they were under, because of how the owners would continuously bombard us with threats of eviction, that there was a certain thing in, that in their mind made them become more, um, much more brave in order to, to, to stay their ground and not move, and to defy the sedition. And you saw that, not just in Felix, but you saw this in Wahan, you saw this in now, Mrs. Delicate, you saw this in So Chang, you saw folks, and, you, and, and they easily could, could, like some people would leave, you know, they could just say, we the love, but they didn't. And, and one of the reasons why they did leave is because they, they couldn't find any place to go that they wanted to be because it was a community. These were their, these were like their family. But the other side was that there was something about how they were just beginning, they began as togethers, they began to become strong. And you see that in the way that they would speak before the crowds, the way that they would say things to people in such, you know, defiance. And Felix personified that so well. He had, he was fearless in the, in the way that he would be out there. Now remember, he couldn't hear. So I always, I always thought the only way that this man could fully understand and grasp this is that he must be highly intelligent in order to be able to take this because he educated crowds of people who 
who would be out there listening to him. And he was really, he was, I mean, we had a human barricade of 3,000 people. Do you don't think that Felix had some input in terms of educating these people so that they could stand with us? Or pickets at City Hall. That's what we did. He drew people to action. It's, it's so important to realize that people, leaders are not born. They're created. They rise up because, because they, they, see, they feel the injustice greatest. And it's people like the tenants and the supporters who recognize Felix as their leader. And that's how I remember him. This man who was in his late 70s, who couldn't hear, but who really was, a rock, was to me a rock star by his stance. Thank you. 525 AM, the first of the elderly tenants walk out, dazed from the front out door of the hotel. He stands there and shaken by the presence of so many police and media people taking his picture begins to walk towards Jackson Street where the thousands of supporters are chanting behind the police barricade. A policeman stops him and directs him towards Clay Street. Another old man exits and is escorted by a young supporter. She asks reporters, do you know where he's supposed to go? No one knows. A Filipino reply, uh, family soon follows. They glare at the deputies as they march out. 5.37 a.m. Felix Eisen, 79 years old, walks out with the aid of two supporters. He tells reporters, I lose my voice, I am totally deaf. I can no longer take care of myself. One man is cursing as he is led away from the hotel. I want to go back to my home. Mr. Yip is 72 years old and he is sporting a Yippie power button on his coat. Sheriff Hogus Hogisto is holding another impromptu news conference on the sidewalk in front of the hotel. He describes the eviction as absolutely nonviolent. We did knock down as many doors as we thought we would have to. Asked about injuries, Hongisto replied, Well, I did scratch my knuckle. 6 10 a.m., Wahatong Pao, a resident since 1961, walks out of the hotel. His jaw is set and there is anger in his eyes. 6 50 a.m., the last of the supporters supporters is taken down from the roof of the hotel. The sun is up. Around the cordoned court off hotel battleground, people are starting to go to work. At Clay and Kearney, six police cars are lined up along Portsmouth Square Park. Pedestrians are stopped for walking up Clay Street. Kearney Street traffic is detoured at Sacramento Street. 7 a.m. Under Sheriff Denman allows the press to enter the hotel. Denman tells his force to be good to the media indicating that the entire eviction has been a production by the entire police and sheriff put on particularly for the media. Inside the hotel, windows and doors were smashed and tenants' rooms were destroyed. It is painful knowing that just hours ago, the hotel was still occupied. Tenants' beds looked as if they had just slept in and the rooms, and the rooms still had personal belongings in them. Most of the tenants are left empty-handed, leaving behind such valuables as television sets, stereos, and even family pictures, one tenant's electric alarm clock was still buzzing. The tenants were forced to leave their homes, not knowing if they would ever see these possessions again. The destruction that occurred during the eviction was extensive, but the building has gone through similar incidents before, and the tenants have always made it livable again. Thank you. I, um, I'm something like uh, part of the other speakers here. I have something with me. Uh, I don't know. It's really my long way. It's not it's just for show. Sure. <laughs> First, I'm going to talk about the talk about Martin de Gaspi. Uh, Martin de Gaspi, uh, I was one of the few who uh, speak uh, some Filipino languages. I speak Visayan, Marayan, Tagalog. So I, I can speak with, uh, with Martin in different languages, um, including English. Uh, a few things you probably don't know too much. By the way, this is the man I'm talking about. And for you, as a teacher, I'm a teacher. I retired a couple of years ago, but in reality, teachers will be all retired. They always have assignments for you. Assignments for you, younger folks. Tell me the three words right here, the complete three words. 
research that for me because I know the answer. <laughs> First, my mom was born in 1896. When I met him, I was in my 20s. Um, I wasn't born in there, but, uh, but I was, uh, I guess, about their age. Right? Uh, I'm looking at Dan Gonzalez here because Dan Gonzalez is a few years younger than me. Um, and he was around at that time, so I'm looking at this guy. So the range is uh, it's about the same. But um, first, Check, check the guy out. That's a dignified person. No matter what this guy said or does, dignity was always just a bar. You know how to do that? He probably goes to the bathroom in constipation with a lot of dignity. <laughs> 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 he was also a painter. He's an artist. Yeah. He painted many, many things. He gave me some. I, I gave some away to the, to the school and I don't know. Uh, I was married a couple of times, maybe like a wife, so I don't know. Uh, but I don't have it now. But I, I had it for a long time. Not only did he give me his paintings, or not uh, some of his paintings, but he, he gave me his inventions. The guy was an inventor too. He was one of the few people to me that I've met that confused science and art naturally. It was a natural science. The guy I would see him in his desk, filming with something, inventing, uh, I don't know what, and then he would be writing a poem and he would be painting. I've never met somebody that's quite as natural as he was in, in uh, I guess, uh, using all the uh, humanity that he had. Of course, his community, uh, his community skills are unparalleled. He was a leader, and he was. Uh, he did a few things to me that I sort of uh, learned a little bit from. And what what is uh, his uh, fusion of academia and community. To me, it was natural there again. But right now, I, I, I noticed, it because I've been teaching for, for a long time, I noticed the education uh, are slightly different now. Community and academia seem to have a hard time meeting each other today. But at that time, people like Manu Nagaspi, it was quite natural to them. In fact, they would not see you as an academic unless they saw you with some community connection. Group and some of the community credentials uh, passed as a requirement, but not that they don't have that anymore. You, you, you got to go to school to get those things. <coughs> uh, the uh, other thing, if you check this out, in all this invention, uh, it, it was at the time when this white guy that was on, TV, uh, was on uh, the movies, he was making a lot of money, he was going to write about the women as usual, you know. And, his name was James Bond. James Bond had not, I mean, this guy had nothing. James Bond had nothing on Joaquin de Gaspi. Because he gave all kinds of gadgets to me. And he fixed all kinds of gadgets to me. I'm, I'm really very poor in machines. So it was probably something really simple, but I was uh, naive. I didn't know. He, 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 to me, his hands were like magic when it came to machines and gadgets. He would fix it. Uh, The third thing that I wanted to sort of uh, impress upon you is that his skill in solution finding. To me, he was not only a philosopher who, who talked about many uh, large issues that affect us as human beings, he also talked specific issues and he solved it. It was like Larry Hitler and Philip Veracruz in one to me. You know? Because Larry Hitler, he didn't uh, talk about uh, many uh, complicated uh, worldwide thing. She talked about a certain issue. There's going to be a strike on Sunday, 10 o'clock. You better show up. If you don't show up, you're in trouble with me. That's that video. And you can follow through. Philip Veracruz would say, you know, you have to go there because, you know, they, they're striking in France, they're striking in Kathmandu. <laughs> all this stuff comes to it. And then right at the door of the International Hotel, you're going to, it's all one to Philip Veracruz. But to me, those two things were combined in Joaquin de Gaspi. And I'm going to end my uh, talk about him by just letting him speak for himself. He was also a poet, as I have told you. In our first book, in, in my opinion, the, one of the first books that ushered in the Filipino-American sens sensibility in literature, Livana and uh, Flips, two books, one of them, we dedicated the uh, Livana book 
to serve in Sikia, where the poets who died while we were doing it, for the of ours, and Manuel Gaspi, who died well, before the, the book came out. He died in 1975, the book came out in 1975. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to uh, try to... And he called it a dedication. He dedicated this. Uh, when ages are to blot memories clear into the inky retreat of the earth, and when the incense of the city ceases the poison, the air, you, with uncanny sight, fleetingly spy a vague hollow. If you see a sort of a halo in the sky, remember it is me.